Craig and Sydney architect Rob Brown. 30 years to design his first house in brick. Well, it was worth the wait. The result is magnificent. When you're there at the beach and you look up here, what do you think? I suppose I compare it with what's around, you know, the bright blue, and the bright green and everything else. And I see the copper roof mellowing to this deep red, the bricks, you know, absolutely blending with the big, enormous sandstone sort of pebbles and the cliff below. I think, well, you know, I think it's doing what it was always intended to do. Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Eve Castle and I'm the National Business Development Manager at Brickworks. It's my pleasure to welcome you and we thank you for joining us whether you're here in our Brisbane design studio, watching across Australia or anywhere internationally. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight is the second instalment of our In Detail speaker series, where we invite industry professionals to connect over a night of insightful conversation. I would like to extend a very warm welcome and thank you to tonight's guest presenter, Jason Blight of Blight Rayner. I know it's a crazy time of year and we really appreciate the time taken to prepare and present for us this evening. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest host, Cameron Brune, Professor Brune, uh, who will formally introduce Jason and also host the Q&A session this evening. Cameron is the Dean and Head of School at the University of Queensland School of Architecture. And prior to, to this appointment, he was the Editorial Director of Architecture Media, where his role included the custodianship of Architecture Australia, the publication we all know and love. More recently, Cameron's been busy adding to his suite of published titles. Um, you can find more about that online and I encourage you to do so. Also, if you are watching online uh, at home, uh, we do invite you also to be part of the conversation this evening. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for Jason during his presentation. And to do so, you can add a comment or email these through to events at brickworks.com.au. You will see prompts throughout the evening, uh, but um, we do ask that you get your questions in by 8.15 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And on that note, I'd like to thank you again and let's get the conversation underway. I'll hand over to you, Cameron. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Eve. So before we kick off with Jason's more formal presentation, we're going to do a little bit of a getting to know you session. Mm -hmm. So this uh, we might think of as uh, beyond the bio. So I wonder, because we have a, a national, if not international audience tonight, if you could just briefly introduce your practice and the work it does. Yep. Thank you, Cameron. Good to see you. Likewise. Uh, and thank you, Brickworks. Um, my practice, Blight Rayner Architecture, has been in um, existence for four years now. In fact, four years, one month. Uh, 2016, October. Um, we set up practice, uh, I set up practice with Michael Rayner. Um, Michael Rayner is um, a true intellect and um, someone that I admire and respect. I worked with Michael um, for 20, 30 years at Cox, the Cox Group, Cox Rayner. Um, we made a decision um, in those mid 
um, times to sort of recalibrate and uh, try and work out what we wanted to do in architecture after a long, um, uh, great and, and a very fruitful um, practice. Um, uh, just recalibrate and, and understand what we wanted out of architecture. So four years in, um, got 30 amazing staff and staff that are, just feel like family. Um, so we've grown, we've grown fast and, and you know, we've got some fantastic projects mm. on the table. So I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to the future. So we might, we might think of you as a kind of middle-age emerging practice. Mm. <laughs> That's quite depressing. <laughs> well, we should established emerging well, practice. Uh, I would say Michael's quite old. <laughs> Um, um, but yeah, me, I'm pretty young. Um, but, uh, but, but we do have a lot of young people. Yeah, we are. And that's interesting. And, and you know, we spoke about that before. Is, is it's interesting to, to, to see architects in their middle age um, uproot out of a very successful, thriving practice and, and start again. Um, yes, you usually see younger um, people do this and, and make that leap of um, faith. But I guess, you know, I, as leaving university, I always saw myself having my own practice. And look, I enjoy it every day. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's very fruitful. And, and, and you know, as I said, um, it's, it's great to employ some young, young people and, and see them um, flourish. And hopefully I can do the same uh, as the Cox Group did for me. Mm. I'll flourish and let them thrive in the architectural world. Mm. We'll come to some more questions about the recent work and the nature of the practice after your presentation. Yep. But I'd like to ask a, just a couple of questions about um, your journey in architecture, your life in architecture. Um, in my role, I'm speaking to high school students mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated by what the trigger might be for someone being interested in studying architecture mm -hmm. um, and following that as a career path, especially if they don't have a family member mm -hmm. in the, the profession or the industry and I, I wonder if you could just reflect on yeah. what might have been the trigger or what inspired you to think about studying architecture? Yeah look I mean I knew at a very young age like I remember clearly um, in year six at school saying I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I guess I, I, I had the pleasure my father is a builder he's, own, he's had his own he had his own um, business as a builder and um, in the, the 70s, in that great brown brick stack blocked way, I got inspired by this very contemporary house in suburbia, um, Everton Hills of Brisbane, seeing these modern um, houses come flourish right through all this, this bushland. Um, so I was inspired at that age, um, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. There was no ifs or buts. Um, I loved the idea of construction. I love the idea of how things go to go together and, and materiality, um, and that's that's where it all started. Um, and so, yeah. Mm. So your father was practicing in that very very late modern um, Brisbane um, mm. architectural mode of the of the brown tumble brick. Yeah, yeah. Which is uh, a period I know a number of us have great admiration for. So having got to university, could you reflect a little on? Um, on a teacher who was particularly inspiring yeah. to you at, at university? Yeah, I, I can. That's that's an easy one. Um, I started at uh, Q, I studied at QUT or it's QIT at the time. Um, that gives away a little bit. You, you yeah, might, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I probably yeah, that, that's, yeah, it does. But that's okay. We'll, we'll get together. We'll, we'll be right. Yeah, won't we? we'll be right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, Q, QIT in the eighties, late eighties. You know, it's an interesting time, and, and, it, and it took some time to get through architecture school. It was a six-year part-time course there at QT, so really it was about um, studying in the nights and on the weekends and then working pretty much 40 hours a week. So really what it did teach you is how to work bloody hard, frankly. Um, an interesting, an interesting um, uh, group of lecturers that I came across, but one that just for, forever has stood out for my, my mind is... Um, the, the late Paula Williamson, who who almost turned a switch on for me in year five, I think. She embraced me. She helped. She opened my mind um, to what's more, more than just what, at that time, QUT was teaching, which was really pragmatic information about how to, you know, remember drawing how a fireplace worked in Queensland, um, or, or you had um, this really rudimentary environmental design 
process, but nothing really global or nothing really showing what's out there. And, and, and Paula, basically, her, her inspiration and what she brought to that school um, was immense. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't speak highly enough mm. about Paula and what she, what she did for me and I know for a lot of other students. Would I, I would dearly say, would just yeah. say the same. Yeah. Mm. Um, she has an incredible, you know, legacy in yeah, the absolutely. in the sort of architectural community, both here and, and nationally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's good to to reflect on her contribution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just one last question before we start having a look at the work. Um, you talked a little bit there about working hard, um, and I think one of the the significant challenges of the profession at this time is to think about questions about work-life balance. Um, and about the expectations of practice. And I just wonder now um, that you are in a different circumstance in terms of your practice, how are you setting the agenda in terms of work-life balance and, and, the, and the culture of, of architecture? Yeah, look, that's, it's really hard um, to, to balance that, and especially um, with my upbringing and education was really about working hard. To, to recalibrate that is a very difficult thing. And especially in the space that we're working in that commercial world in some parts, it's the expectations are fairly phenomenal. Um, and especially now in the day of um, electronic um, information and the transfer of information, it's expected immediately. Um, and, and you know, Revit and, and, and the programs that we use are truly amazing, but, um, but they're, they're expectations have risen. So it's, it's extremely difficult to balance out um, our work-life balance, I, I, I would say, even though we try and promote that um, and, and we do practice it, but there are times where you just can't because it, uh, architecture is fully immersive. You're in and if you want that job to be right and, and fight for those right outcomes, you, you have to be fully immersed in it. So it's a difficult question, one that I haven't got any answer to, but we, we are, we are mm. we're finding our ways week in, week out to, to try and achieve those, That's great. those aspirations. So tonight, tonight you're going to give us a, yeah. a sort of overview of some recent projects, yeah. um, and then we'll come back together at the end of, of yeah. Jason's presentation uh, for a bit more of a discussion, yeah. um, interrogation of some of the themes um, and types that have that have emerged in the in the recent trajectory of your practice, um, but also we'll take some questions from um, the audience, both in the room and online. Yep. So, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. Um, tonight. I want to talk, I will take you through a number of projects, but really the topic of this conversation that I would like to go through is all about form, space, structure, and material. These four elements interest me greatly, but I think more importantly, there are two other concepts that I would like to talk about um, through the work that I'm going to show you, both re retrospectively, but also going forward. Um, these are the idea of how these four elements are immersed and embrace landscape. That's a, a very crucial element and something very dear to my heart. I love landscape, I want to be in landscape. So I want to show you how our architecture is embracing that. The second one is just as this slide's showing is how shadow play, and I'll talk about shadow play and how material and form can work on shadow play. So this little, um, cover is um, a picture of a project that we're almost complete at St. Margaret's, which is this interaction with um, a very cheap face block and then um, brickworks, um, blonde brick. Um, I think it's important to illustrate those concepts for me to go back in time and, and through history and what I've grown up with and how I've learnt the craft of architecture. So just allow me to sort of go back for about three projects. Um, and these three projects are dear to my heart. I uh, worked pretty bloody hard on them. Um, and they're of varying scales, both public and, and private. I think these three projects that I'm going to go, go through tonight very, very quickly before we get into the, to the five odd projects that Blight Rayner have worked on or working on, um, they have laid, laid this foundation for me um, that has given me a much broader architectural perspective. 
and that have influenced my way of thinking um, and these projects that I'm going to show you. So the first project um, is 111 Eagle Street while I was at Cox Rainer. Um, this project spans back from 2006 to 2012. Um, 111 Eagle Street was a study in structural dynamics. It was a structural solution that we devised, or Cox devised, with Arabs on how you could transfer loads into very strategic pinpoints. Why? Um, because the site in which it was had three levels of basement, a substation, and a whole lot of other in, in, um, uh, existing um, elements. And if we didn't do that, um, and in a normal structural situation of a post and beam, we would have ended up with transfer floors, almost three floors of solid concrete to transfer the loads out. So this was my first real great experience in how structure and how structure can work um, to the positive. Not to mention this building was a very stressful building. Um, when, when it was one in 2006, um, how would you like to build a building between two of Harry Seidler's most heroic and stoic buildings in Brisbane? Not, yeah, I did feel the pressure, I must admit, um, working on this project. But I, I think you know, to, to mimic or, or, or to relate to Harry's work would have been wrong. So, to, so for it to be a counterpoint of light and reflectiveness, I think, um, works for me personally. So of interest out of this project um, was really how structure can create patterns. Um, so this, this, this idea of how structure could be patterned and really where we started to work with Arabs on this was through um, setting up algorithms. We went through about 1,500 different algorithms, setting different rules at that time. So I thought, oh, this is pretty amazing. You can just set these kind of things. The computer works overnight and spits out a pattern. And then you get it and you go, mm, that doesn't look very good. Then we sort of looked more at um, the context. And there's these two amazing fig trees, if you know, in the city on the corner of Creek and um, Eagle Street. And you started to look at the structure of the way that was sort of growing up and lightening. And as it went up, it, it was lighter. It sort of went out on these rogue things and then it had these tentacles came down. So that then became this idea of setting an algorithm to the structure that was about how a tree grows or how it gets lighter as it gets to the top with these rogue elements. So that was my first kind of real introduction to how important structure is or how important structure can be to these type of buildings, but also how they can affect the architecture and what I got out of that. The second point that I wanted to make on this project is really to do with the ground plane and the level one, um, the level one arrival space. Um, as I said before, landscape's dear to my heart, and the image um, on the very uh, left-hand side there is really the ground plane and how it is immersed. It is basically embedded in the landscape. It looks across the riparian plaza with the growth of um, the palm trees. On the other side, it looks across the fig trees. And then on the northern side, it looks across the um, plaza of Riverside Centre. So really the ground plane and getting it anchored into the landscape was a very important part of that. And I guess then a counterpoint is this elevated entry lobby, which is light, it's reflective. Um, it is also perched and it's perched to allow those views out. Um, I think also that just another layer to that is this idea of craft and um, quality of, um, of detailing. That was something that I really uh, did enjoy in this um, this process, albeit a long process it was over that time. The second, second project obviously is relating to brick um, and it's the Aperture House. Um, this house um, is my own personal house with my partner Melissa Blight of Twofold Studios, so it was a collaboration with Melissa um, and a collaboration with a lot of other subcontractors as well. Um, this house was purposely, uh, this was happening while finishing 111 in that great um, design and construct um, procurement method. This was purposely designed to create a new forum of 
um, how you might procure a job. I personally went in as owner builder um, and I wanted to hand select all the people I worked with as subcontractors. That was important to me after knowing, going through that whole DNC process. And then the next project I'll talk about again, which is a totally different procurement method. Um, it's interesting. So three very different procurement methods that have just made me think how buildings are procured and, and, and what benefit do you get out of each of those procurements um, is something that is also very dear to my heart. And navi navigating that is a, is, is a minefield. Um, so this house here, for me, was a study of multiple um, ideas. The first real domestic scale building after graduating in sort of mid 90s. So yeah, some time on. So after working on a lot of big commercial public buildings, this is my first um, project in um, domestic, of a domestic scale. Um, we bought the Queenslander at the back, uh, at the front, and then um, and one of the main ideas of that was it was this gangly Queenslander that had no relationship to its backyard. It frustrated us. We saw this oasis out there. We wanted to get there. We couldn't through this Queenslander. So the first thing was, well, how do we make this thing accessible? How do we get this building down into the landscape? So that's where the idea um, uh, emerged of this idea of brick and how this brick plinth could be that way to get us down into that landscape. The second idea was really coming back to landscape. I, we wanted to create a building that was basically in the ground, in the landscape. We wanted the plants to grow over it. We had just come back from Ankar Wat, Ankar Tom did those architectural things, fantastic but just so inspired by the way landscape could take over architecture rather than, as I was taught in those days, we were just talking about that, of buildings touching very lightly and touching the land very lightly. I wanted to kind of work against that and get stuck into the landscape, and get down and dirty, if you like. So this idea of green immersion um, came into the work and something that is now very dear to my heart and something that we're starting to implement in the work that we're doing um, at Blight Rainer. The third idea was really how spatial qualities in volume rather than footprint gave a sense of generosity. So this house is, and Melissa will kill me, um, but she's, it's all of 150 square metres and there's four people living in there. I think in a very generous way, she might argue sometimes that it's not, but I think it is. And if you think um, of that space, the image on, on the right, to give you an idea of that width, that's a 3.6 metre wide space by the um, loggia to the side in the dining room where the photo's taken is all of five metres as our main living space. Um, to me, the sense of light and, and volume and how it opened up to the backyard gives that sense of generosity of space to me. It's not necessarily needed in footprint. Now, the, the fifth element um, to this is, and these are photos by Rose, so thank you, Rose, um, is a study in brickwork and the structural op opportunities that exist in brickwork. Um, when we started out on this project, I had the pleasure to meet um, Elvis and Rose, who are here tonight, so thank you for coming, AKA Shane and Reese. Um, some call them the dynamic duo. Um, yeah, they are, and they're incredibly um, insightful. Um, they interviewed me for this project, and I was lucky enough um, to win the job, so I was quite happy um, for them to come. So every, in that whole time frame of when this was under construction, um, we would meet every morning on site, and we would talk about what we're going to build today. That went on for a full year, almost seven days a week. I think the Sundays became Chardonnay, I think, or something like that. I wasn't really doing much work then. But Shane would insist that I actually draw what we would do in the dirt or on a, on a board rather than my drawings. We'd spend hours drawing this stuff and he'd throw them away and say, no, what are we doing? You draw it here. So a, quite an interesting process working with um, Shane and Reese on this project and really opened my eyes up to what the possibilities of brick are. 
In that sense, you can see you know, this idea of a simple brick, and we talked about what the space between the brick was. And I'm going, what are you, what are you talking about, the, the space between the brick? And we started, to, we started to build them on site. And as you can see, the image on the right is this idea of space between the brick, where the per pen is actually revealed. It's cut away, the sense of beyond through that, or, or the bed itself is actually mortar that's been made up with aggregate and then hand rubbed to get that effect. So that negative space between each one of those bricks is a very important part of architecture and especially in masonry, which I learned out of those uh, years. So I'm very thankful of um, Shane and, and Reese for that education. In fact, I learned more about brick than I did ever did at university on, on site. Um, but I think also what, what I got out of this was that as we, were draw, as we were making decisions on the run, and you can see even on this cantilevered seat, we, we, we mocked up multiple different opportunities on what that aperture might be, but this idea of this cantilevered brick seat, which you think, oh, you can't do that. But it can show how light brick can be if, you, if you're in the right hands of a tradesperson. But I think um, just that point about um, light and light reflectivity, and I think that's kind of um, picked up on this image on the right, which I absolutely love, is the way something two-dimensional can be so three-dimensional with the way light hits it. You can see the light is coming back through um, a concrete plane behind, and it's basically announced itself with these very golden lines. And this interplay of light and shade is something that excites me every day. Every time I wake up and have my wheat bix or coffee, um, you're looking at this light and hitting this, and it's this three-dimensionality that I've got a lot of um, joy out of, and I hope um, the next few projects that I show you um, so you can see how that is starting to evolve in our practices work. Um, the third and final retrospect, um, retrospective um, projects is the last project um, that I worked on, uh, which is the National Maritime Museum of China. So a totally different procurement method, obviously, in a, in a um, communist country. Um, we were designing this project while going to site and working through the bricks. So I'm working in a scale of bricks and worrying about the negative space while trying to design an 80,000 square metre um, museum um, in China um, in six weeks. It was ridiculous. Um, but nevertheless, a great experience. I met a lot of very interesting people. And I think um, one, one, one day, obviously, I, I left um, the practice um, uh, before it was finished, and it was only just opened um, mid last year. Yeah, the thing that I got out of this building is the idea, as I said at the, at the beginning, form. A form was something that was exciting me, and as we were drawing these, it's how you could make these forms um, so sinuous and so subtle and so scaled for a building of that scale. Structure. Structure is a big one on this one, and I'll explain that in a second. But then also, before all that, it was landscape and how such a massive building of that scale over two stories, it's 80,000 square metres, 40,000 square metres of, of, of gallery space in one and over two levels. How do you make a building like that a scale building? And that was our driver at the time. And how do you get landscape to interact with that? The five halls, there are five halls um, that, that make up this building, um, and they're, they're all scaled in different ways, but there's, and there's many um, symbolic um, and multiple metaphors that were applied to this, um, this building. Um, this is one of the last halls that sits on the garden, and the garden is directly to our right, um, hall, 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 hall five. Um, you can see here the beginnings of the pattern skin, this aluminium skin and curved glass that was wrapping um, these uh, ribbed portal frames. Um, these ribbed portal frames danced all the way out um, to the cantilever. You could see in the distance those portal frames then were braced back with this series of tubes um, intensely, more intensely where they needed to be. So it was again this idea of patterning structure. And to give you an idea of these cantilevers and the scale of that, some of these cantilevers go out to about 55 metres. So something that you wouldn't even dream of doing in Australia of that sort of scale. 
So, you know, an interesting um, scenario there. Um, I think also what was important to this is the idea of these five halls and how the spaces between them became um, important to me and they became important elements of landscape. Um, and I think a great public opportunities for, 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 for opportunities for the public to, to immerse themselves in that landscape. Each hall, ha each hall has a, a varying scale and each gallery opens up to its environment, um, which is not normal in galleries, um, but we control that in multiple ways. Um, it allowed the visitors to be also conscious and uh, conscious of their environment as they're sort of walking through those halls to connect to that environment. Um, so that's where this descaling of such a monumental um, scale building was an important aspect. Um, you can see here the idea of those ribs and the bracing that basically holds this um, building up. Um, I guess what I also learned from this is it was a project or a, a project or an essay in perseverance, a very difficult project. But um, what I did get out of it was how you could scale um, and how you could break down a massive building. And that really came back to these five fluid forms that are dynamic, has a patterning of structure, um, and my view, um, very complex, but very singular as a piece of architecture. So those three projects are where I am today and what I think today in the projects that we're delivering. Um, and this is, I think, one of the images um, of just recently as it being finished. At, at this point, I just did want to say something about uh, a particular project architect that I worked on, on, this, on this project with, uh, Hung Ling. Hung is a true gentleman, an amazing person. Uh, I put him, or he was put into a very difficult position over there. We, we, we worked extremely hard. Um, I learned a lot of Mandarin from him. I learned the important swear words in Mandarin from him, but I could never have the courage to use them. I would say them, but then Hung would translate them for me, but he would never translate the swearing. I knew he wouldn't because I knew what the swear words were. But that was the frustration. But Hung um, was a true gentleman, a true professional. He's having a bit of a tough time at the moment, and I'm very um, thankful for him. Um, and so I just want to say um, my thoughts are with you, Hung, and I uh, hope you get better soon, and um, I'm sure you will, and get back into architecture um, because you are sorely missed. So that then takes me to um, Blight Rainer and where we are today. We're four years in, as I said to Cameron, four years in and one month. Um, a, a, a immense staff, a fantastic staff of 30 people, um, which has been a, a, a whirlwind. Um, started in October 2016, um, and here we are today with a number of projects being built. So what I want to do is take you through three uh, or five projects, two, two domestic and three more commercial and one, or two commercial and, and one a school that is just almost completed. The first project we did with Alex Munoz, um, which is this conceptual house we designed as a post-apocalyptic dwelling. And it was designed um, to be a house for an extended family and to live self um, sustainably. It's located in a sur suburban uh, 430 square metre lot. It provides for three generations to coexist in one space, in one house uh, and connect. The house has no front yard, has no backyard. It fills the block entirely. It allows then other, other buildings to plug onto it as it grows or how, how people grow or want to grow out of the building. When designing this, we set the challenge um, to how can we incorporate effectively four self-contained residents within this 430 square metre lot with ample opportunity um, for each family member or family groupings to socialise, but as well to enjoy their own degrees of privacy. So the plan is very, the plan is very simple in the sense of each um, resident has a different configuration, so of the four, um, you're enabled occupants to choose what 
were best suiting you. So on the ground floor, there are three um, residents that you can see up in this location and this location. Um, they can be, um, they, they, each resident has their distinct entrance points, so you can enter in there, in there, so there's no interdependency inter um, of anybody within this. So you can live separately or you can come together. And that was the important part of what we were trying to achieve in the planning of this. Um, there's a large common, common area as where everybody comes together. In this space, there's a cook cooking facilities. They also have their own little kitchenettes within each of their room. The common also has a book and digital library. There's a second common space on the first level. So this being, this, this being the second level uh, is another common space that allows then accesses out to veggie gardens or even other gardens through here. And what's interesting here on the fourth, on the fourth um, residence, which is this tower through here, um, mainly for the younger people of the house as you go up the stairs, um, is that it's cloaked uh, with these two wings that you saw in this, in this, in this space, these two wings through here. This um, two-story module that is set back from the boundary allows daylight into it. Um, it's seen as a steel and glass um, if you like, trough, um, and it's filled with algae. Um, that algae then provides a bio biomass. So as it heats up, it creates a biomass, and that biomass then creates a re renewable source of energy. So that's a critical part of expressing the architecture. Rainwater or droplets or humidity from that space comes down, and then it also feeds into a hydroponic, si hydroponic system. Wind turbines sit on top. Wind turbines sit on top and then um, photovoltaic cells supplement that renewable energy, the, the, that being the biomass. Um, battery storage um, that sat in the bottom, so all that energy that was created is stored into that battery, into the basement, and then allows you to live without any power for three months. So pretty interesting um, when we designed this in 2016 and where we are now in this kind of environment of almost, <laughs> you could say, almost apocalyptic situation. Um, but this house is relatively cheap in that sense. Um, it's made of block work, um, perforated in some areas, as you can see, um, with windows behind that to allow cross ventilation, pivoting walls. Inside, we see this house as being all timber, this almost warm, um, warm crafted, almost human, human quality um, to the lining, just a simple lining of timber, really then as a counterpoint to that really rough, raw exterior. So that then gives us multiple generations of one family, even multiple families can live in such a, a building type. So, an interesting project that I wanted to share with you um, and an interesting connection back to what is, can be very simple materials done in very creative ways. Um, the next project, the second project, um, is St. Margaret's. It's a sports facility um, for a girls' school. Um, and I just would like to acknowledge the hard work of Madeline Sweet Kelly, um, Lauren Hickling, Peter Brown, who is here, um, Simon Swain, who also worked on the brick detailing, um, Akiko and Arlene. Um, without them, this project wouldn't have been realised. It's still under construction, um, and we hope to be complete um, in the early in the new year. Um, this project is an interesting project. It's, sit, it's, um, it's located on a hill. Um, you can see the school itself, the campus itself is this sort of thing on the ridge of the hill. It's in a very um, mixed use scaled setting from a domestic to six packs in that kind of 70s way. Um, it also with regards to petrol stations and gyms and other types of building types around. So a very eclectic scaled um, environment. Um, the challenge was put to us 
was that the school had a number of sporting um, equipment and, and buildings in and around in, in, in the campus that were either out of life or couldn't be rectified. So our approach was to um, decommission those and bring into one singular, oops, sorry, one singular, one singular sports precinct where it joined all of the facilities being a 25 metre, 50 metre pool, a new gymnasium, tennis courts, ergo gym and HPE. It also really was about modernising those facilities, ensuring that the girls had something that they could actually participate in the Australian curriculum, which they couldn't currently do that um, in their facilities that they had um, um, up until now. The, the, the first sort of move really was, um, as I said before, we're on the side of a hill. So it falls greatly from this street down to La Prank Street, falls across and falls this way. This campus came through here. This is an existing 60s, um, 70s brick building and a little primary school um, Churchill lawn that sat here. The planning is deliberately orthogonal um, and orthogonal to ensure that spaces are created. It's incredibly pragmatic in terms of the spatials. Um, the gym building sits in this location here. The gymnasium building is obviously, it, it suits basketball and netball, so it's intrinsically scaled and big in its own right. It has to be to, for it to perform. Um, so the first move was to bring this large-scale building back down into the site and bury it or hunker it into the landscape and with that cut. The second move was by setting that datum that related directly to the existing level of the lower level was per beautifully two tennis courts to, could fit into that space. We have then found that we had one plane for the girls to gather. So taking that to the next level, when the pool was brought in as the brief developed, which is this pool here, which is a, a polo, water polo um, and a short course um, pool and then a 50 metre lap pool, we decided to make this level through all the way through. So you've got one contiguous level that does not occur on this side anywhere um, for, this, for the girls. So uh, amazing move, uh, I think, um, and a sense of generosity to be able to get the thousand odd students all into one space on one level um, all together has been, I guess, um, a testament to the school to give us that ability to do such a thing. Um, this level here almost creates a I guess uh, a MESA in the sense of a, f a flat plane, if I bring it back to landscape, this idea of this MESA that starts to come out of the ground and then cantilevers back out to the street and then it cascades down into the lower La Plank Street. Um, the, the elevation you see on the bottom here is the Butler Street. This is the gymnasium that I'm referring to here. That's the existing um, Chasley building and in the distance is this building through here. So an elevation through the gymnasium and tennis courts and then a section through the new HPE building, the 25 metre pool and then the change facilities as they, as they terrace down to natural ground, all the while opening up and protecting Churchill Lawn. The architecture is in response, um, architecturally it's in response to break down the scale of the heights of these buildings. Um, especially this gym building here. Um, the idea to break that architecture down was the first move was to introduce this idea of a neutral coloured white brick. That brick then becomes the whole point in which everything launches from. It becomes the architecture that you see on this street and as it comes through and rises to become this HPE building and cascades over the edge to La Prank Street. The gym itself is articulated into two, which is this element here, which is this lightweight translucent frieze. The pool itself also has this lightweight um, cloister, if you like, to the pool, which is basically slatted um, panels to allow light, and I'll show you some images of that, to allow that light to seep into that space. 
So materials were further articulated through patterning, um, and that patterning in the brickwork mainly, but also in colour and the way the frieze of the gymnasium works. The panels then interplay, the panels within the pool you can see here, uh, apertures are created, and these are strategically located as you move through that space to the large trees that uh, exist on the other side or even to the mountains into the distance. So they're very um, pointed in with regards to their, their location. And they start to take on forms um, that you see within the sports field, in the hoops and the circles um, that, that exist right throughout the patterning of that ground plane. Um, this is an image from Butler Street. You can see uh, just recently in construction. So the tennis courts sit through here, a big guillotine door that opens up that makes one seamless space from tennis courts into the gym building. This frieze is designed and angled to, res to, to actually work with that point that I mentioned before, of shadow play. Um, I was very interested in shadow play here with the idea of um, and translucency and colour. So this gives you an idea of that. The, it's, it's angular in its form um, and it's responding to the east and west um, aspects. It's also translucent, so you can see in the distance, so the, the actual door is up and into that gym space. It's translucent, it allows different light to come into that space. It's a bold gesture, I guess, if you like, and there's been a lot of um, conversations around in the neighborhood about this color. Um, but I think you know this idea of colour shouldn't be. I don't think. Um, I think it should be debated. In fact, uh, I, I get quite a kick out of it, and I think just embracing this idea of colour as a celebratory colour of the school, it is what their sporting life is about. And I think to um, be proud of that, I think is a, is a great thing for the school. On the flip side, um, on the LaPrank Street side, you can see the white brick and how it's coming through to create the base of the entrance. So the white brick's coming through, the pool in the distance, and it's coming up and through to support this lightweight cloister. The bricks rise up to create this um, uh, gym building and HPE um, learning centre. A view of that aperture that looks back out in the flip side, I'll, I'll show in, a, another, in another shot, is a view to this beautiful jacaranda. Working through how the bricks could be um, modified as screens by turning the brick on edge, this gives you an idea of that, um, the idea of these slats that we've, proposed, that we've used to allow this dappled light to run through, and again, skylights over the learn to swim that just sits on the other side of this wall. This is that view here of the Learn to Swim space. Great aperture back to this um, fantastic jacaranda tree. Um, this is where I get uh, the excitement of all the learnings of that year, of every morning talking about negative space, um, learning about negative space, and learning about what bricks might be and what they could be. Um, the team had great joy in developing this, um, and especially under the, the, the watchful eye of Simon Swain, who is a, an amazing architect and um, helped us uh, through this journey. So I, I've got to respect that and um, thank him for that. The brick detailing, as you can see, brings through coursing. Um, this idea of historic rustication, I should say, the site has a multiple number of very beautiful heritage buildings up on that upper area. So picking the details out of that and bringing that up and reinventing it. I should say though, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, the school did go through a number of those kinds of buildings that were built in that not, not very respectful way to the heritage buildings that exist there. Um, they turned the back onto them. They're very tinny, very lightweight buildings. They weren't really doing much or creating space for the school. So um, it was great that the school could see the need for architecture and quality architecture for it to be embedded and for this for the girls. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the girls um, using this space and um, being inspired by the architecture. Um, this obviously does, it is all about craft and that's something that I get quite excited about, the human, the human contact and the human craft. 
ledges that Peter worked tirelessly on, corbels to take um, the artwork that um, um, St. Margaret's hold very dear and proud to their, um, to their school um, will be located on this brick wall. Screens, as I said before, that takes us then into where the change room facilities, so this is as you've come out of the pool and you're going back down into the change room facilities. At each access down to there are these apertures where we've turned the brick on the end and we've started to use those extrusions. We've started to align those extrusions and lining them up and cutting them to make that primary and secondary pattern. Um, incredibly complex, um, and don't you think it was hard to explain this to a builder of what we were going to do? But nevertheless, we fought through it and we got there. Um, but I think there's, um, again, like the museum that I explained, there's incredible in complexity, but yet simplicity in this. Skylights um, that mark um, these points as you come down into spaces like this. A very civic, um, grand volume um, that takes that take the girls whoops that take the girls down um, down into the change room facilities all punctured by these skylights to bring that natural light through and then these these natural ventilation of to the north to allow uh, that are these perforated bricks uh, again ventilation being a big aspect of that and a view of the change facilities here, down through here, um, back into that grand space that I just showed you, looking out towards the north um, and bringing ventilation through. The third project is a commercial project. It's Jubilee. Um, it's, again, this one was one of the first projects that we um, successfully won um, in 2016, at the end of 2016. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge Chris, Chris Lewis on this job, Madeline John, um, Jasper Brown, who was a key part of the team in building this, um, Chris Price, and I think even, I think Pete, Peter Brown worked on it, so multiple people have touched this building, so, and I appreciate that. Jubilee is located on the edge of the Fortitude Valley and the edge, so the edge of Fortitude Valley station here, and then the RNA showgrounds. Um, it's a light perched, a lightly perched, if it could ever be, 14-storey commercial building. It became the catalyst to reinvigorate um, what is the Jubilee Hotel, this pub here, which was pretty much dilapidated and not and had seen better days. So this project has given that um, hotel a second life. The proposal itself is a lightweight steel. Um, building, close your, close your ears, Eve. Um, there is a tower that sits and spreads its loads over the Clem 7. So the Clem 7 runs directly, oops, the Clem 7 runs directly under the site, which are these here. So we had to spread the loads. So again, this idea of structure and how structure can actually um, work to actually make a site like this productive. The structural solution and the structure that you saw intertwines externally to internally to externally. Again, something that I learned um, through my experience at 111. But more importantly with this project is you can see the core to one side is that it's a 100% contiguous floor plate and this structure pretty much gives us a column free, only four columns within that footprint. And that footprint is a 1,500 square metre footprint. So amazing in that sense for, um, for, for tenants uh, to have multiple flexibility. Also multiple flexibility of how we can perforate the floor with voids and connections. Um, whereas generally in concrete buildings, you're pretty well dictated that they can only be in certain points. So through this steel strategy, we've been able to give a, ten a tenant's that flexibility. But I think more importantly, if I use that word again, um, on this project and the next project, it's about the ground plane. And th that's generally um, what I think these commercial buildings must do, is they must create a sense of quality at the ground plane, a sense of publicness. And that's what this project does in my view. The tower itself hovers, um, hovers over 
a mason over the tower itself ho hovers over a masonry base, which is this element here. Um, that masonry base is eroded in multiple ways, in many ways, to create a three-dimensional form. It's a brick base, Eve, um, that is made up of garden bond walls. It holds the edges of the site um, and it deals with all sorts of falls and cross falls that we have. With that brickwork, the way we've, um, we've crafted it, it creates ledges. It creates ledges for landscape to occupy. It also creates ledges for people to occupy. Um, which, I'll, which you would have seen in that other perspective. I won't go back, it's a bit hard to go back on this thing. Um, but not, uh, not to mention though, this base really does become the launch pad of this glass and steel building that then hovers above that. This gives you an idea of the public space. So this is that eroded um, brick base that comes around to reconcile the vault multiple levels, the Jubilee Hotel on the left-hand side. By doing this and eroding this podium, we've been able to create this public space off Constant Street, off the Constant Street on this side, St Paul's ter Terrace here, a heavily traffic space. So the idea of creating this respite in this area was important to us. It will be a landscape space, it will be a meeting space, it'll be that third space for tenants and visitors to come together um, in this, all again, um, uh, all again flanked by retail and activation. On the other side, the um, Jubilee Hotel expands with a new beer garden. The brick fragments come around and hold this new beer garden and these, um, I guess, new timber um, structural uh, form that then becomes the canopy to the beer garden become things that, that people sit within, like booths that sit along the Constant Street. Again, as you can see, landscape and brick and that patterning brick unites this site. But like an epiphyte does, that's what this is really about. This elevated steel building rises out of this very brick base. And that's really where we're quite excited, while well, we're excited about the structural drama um, and patterns that are occurring on site today. Um, it's really about how this brick, crafted brick base becomes this possibility of creating public space to create these ledges, as I said, landscape opportunities, breakout spaces, the louvered facades that will sit around there becomes a launching pad for this 14-storey building. Um, the fourth project and the second last project is Hassel Street um, in Parramatta. This project we're doing in collaboration with Zahns. Um, it was a competition we won in 2018 um, run by the Parramatta City Council. It's an interesting building in the sense um, it's a hybrid building um, for Western Sydney University, sorry Cameron, um, and, but it does bring together um, the, 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 the engineering department of that into this and mixes it with the commercial world. An interesting kind of, um, um, I guess, hybrid building, which we haven't seen much of in Brisbane, but I, I can imagine that this, this this model will work. Um, again, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge uh, Madeline Sweet Kelly, um, Georgie, and Akiko and Arlin as our main um, stalwarts on this project um, and working closely with the great team at Zahns. This building is currently under construction um, and is, is sort of is up to about here, I think, at the moment. What's important about this, like Jubilee, is how the ground plan and how the ground plane can offer a public quality. Um, interesting, it overlooks the Lancer Barracks, which is here, which is this historic military base, which it is private. Um, so our first strategic move was to open up the ground plane in a way that's set up for the future for when this space will open up, and it will because it's such a delight um, green heart of Parramatta, which is a, in a, pretty, is a pretty tough environment, um, can connect directly out into there. So that was our first in, important move to this um, project. 
th this is how we sort of started to approach the form. The form originally um, that the planner, the planning led form was this, um, this was how we devised it, but it was pretty much a big fat building long um, and squat. And basically what we tried to do was start to say, let's pull it apart. Let's create this idea of stepping. That then goes into these next level of key moves within the building and how we got to where we got to. This, the first one, as I said before, was to elevate the ground plane and open up the ground plane for maximum to maximise the public realm into Lancer Barracks. Sculpt the form to address entry, but also to address its aspect north, north out this way over Lancer Barracks and west to the train station. So the building is purposely shaped a way to respond to that aspect. The next layer to that form was to create these erosions or carve outs. These carve outs then allowed light to go deep into these floor plates. These are large floor plates in this lower area up to, up to around 2000 square meters here. Those carve outs then create opportunity for ledges and ledge, ledges for occupation, landscape for tenants and university students to break out into these spaces and connect this Lancer Barracks um, um, landscape back up into it. And then obviously making the form textural, the idea of sun shading to the west, patterning that, um, and again playing with that point that I made before about shadow play. Here's a section through the building. Um, and again, as I said, the, the point of this is we've lifted, we've lifted the base of the building. And really the first, this, this lifting creates a datum. And that datum is driven by the pub seems to be, that's two projects next to a pub, um, that sets a datum to the tower itself. But it also relates to the scale of the, um, the, the, the heritage buildings within Lancer Barracks. One of the strategic moves was it had a, um, the brief allowed for a basement. What we wanted to do was re-engineer that idea of what a basement was. The idea then of the university overtaking that basement, carving out a great hole in the middle of that basement to create a new space for the university um, as a maker space. That got us a lot more FSR in this development and it allowed us to push a car park level down below that. So this is a very intri intrinsic part of the and strategic part um, of the building and how it works at the ground plane. And the next series of shots show you that. So Hassel Street, this idea um, of this new ground plane through to this void space that goes down into the maker spaces below, the engineering making spaces, robotic labs on the street, the commercial entrance off to one side and a retail pavilion. And you can see the linkage back into um, Lancer Barracks. A cross section of that strategy that I just spoke about, cars under, this basement that became the maker spaces, amphitheater stairs, the main street level through here, all the while looking down. And really an important part of this is about in connecting universities to the corporate world or even just people walking by. That's really what we were trying to achieve here is really showcase the workings of a building. That also then goes into the workings of how the structure of this building was working um, and for that to be on display gives you an idea of the main foyer level, um, looking down into that maker space, and then this new stair that connects over five levels across that public space, a little retail pavilion to the west, allowing um, natural light to spill into that space. As I said, it's currently on site now, um, and some photos just in. Um, I haven't been able to get down there due to COVID, and I'm dying too. Um, this is that main entry space that I spoke about before, the retail pavilion, a coffered concrete suffete. So this is that datum in which launches the glass tower above um, the retail pavilion. The stair that connects the basement all the way up through um, the, the, that, this level here up into the university spaces. All on show and all, all, all um, showing the vitality of how this building um, work. 
What's interesting is in this case is that the whole core is a side core. It's all made out of precast and the way we've patterned it to, again, as I said before, being really about these ledges and light shelves and all these ideas of shadow play within this precast core then generates that, that's that line that I spoke about before, which is this new um, datum. This is Yihan from Zahn's and he's doing his weekly inspections and doing the right thing, photographing it for everybody and calling out the builders <laughs> where they do wrong. Um, in this building, because that core is offset to the side, cross bracing was important to stabilize it, um, and which is in steel. So you can, see, you can see this cross bracing that is stabilizing and the pin jet conjunct, um, junctions and the expression of those that occur throughout the building. This is on that retail pavilion, which is going to be a breakout space um, and landscaped area where you're elevated over Lancer Barracks, and that's the cross brace. So really, this is a precast core, um, in situ concrete and steel and glass building. Um, the last project that I'll go through um, is a project that um, we just received a commission on this year. It's called The Lighthouse. Um, it's still early days. We're in sketch design and still drawing madly. And at this point, I would like to acknowledge Alex for his hard work. He knows he does a lot of work, and he mentioned that to me before. And thank you for that, Alex. Um, but Mad Madeline Sweet Kelly, Georgie, um, and um, as the key uh, architects on this project. This is um, an interesting project um, that the in the sense of the house is an, uh, not a new house, it's basically alterations and additions to this house up here. Um, this is the existing site plan of this really large 1920s masonry and terracotta tiled roof house that rambles internally um, from dark room to dark room. It has no distinctive social space. It has no respect for context. Um, not that you can see much here. There's a house here and there's here, but there's no respect to context. There's no even prospect. Um, having said that, that he, this house is not the only one in this little enclave that exists um, that don't really have any respect um, with the scale and size of, of the houses that exist. So, on receiving this commission, our first thing, um, talking with the client, um, was, was music to our ears, their love of light. Okay, oh, wow, this is a job for us. So this idea then became one of almost um, subtraction, if you like. So having to keep the front part of the house, we've subtracted a lot of the bulk out of that and we've then reconfigured how the house works. Um, it works in an L shape in primary, but in secondary, a little pavilion through here. So it's generated almost a U shape plan. North out this way, so a north or an east northeast courtyard to that space, which previously turning its back on and basically opening up to the west. These slight moves also then give some um, sense of relief to the neighbouring house that sits through here and the, again, the amalgamation of landscape. Um, so this is located on a 1,600 square metre lot, so to give you a sense of that scale, um, and it is long and uh, long and it's, it's linear in its kind of form. So a little kind of axonometric of the approach is that what we've done or what we're proposing to do is a re, um, as I said, uh, a re... Um, um, uh, a, a reworking, if you like, of what, how the ground plane works, almost ripping all that out in that sense because it's so dysfunctional, um, but creating a series of masonry or brick walls that basically make their way from outside to inside, um, creating the various spaces and defining um, new edges. The walls undulate in different scales um, and then they dissolve in areas like here and here. So there is no sense of boundary um, to this site. It's linked clearly to this 
um, east northeastern courtyard and the large um, rear backyard. Other little courtyards start to occur off study spaces, little TV rooms with their own courtyards. So every part of the site is productive and does add value to the use and this re replanning of the lower level. The, the um, I guess the, the idea then of the roof and how that roof works is this idea of re inventing what is a very uh, a language of hips, gables, ridges and valleys. We've taken those geometries and we're reinventing them. We're inserting new um, roofs in that way of folding. Um, so this arm that comes out to the western flank comes and folds down on certain edges and then on the eastern stuff, on this eastern side, it pops up to collect light and bring light deep into that floor. This little pavilion then stops and creates that, um, I guess, that civic courtyard to this space. Um, in section, I guess, here, this little section, I think, is intrinsic to this um, and, and the idea, which is a section through this roof here, is um, the morning winter sun coming into this new central common space. But also this northwestern sun, I guess I was very interested in, and I was very interested in, in allowing um, and, and controlling it, but actually bringing it in in a direct sense. So bringing in direct light into this space, bouncing it through and bringing it down into this uh, eastern edge of the main common or main gathering space onto this courtyard. This just gives you an idea of that new the new common and the new courtyard um, that sits through here, the idea of activating and a new skyline through these pop-up roofs and, and, and light, light captures, um, uh, light scoops to capture the light deep into the existing floor plan. The, the ground plan configuration, um, we basically start all projects in that in hand, um, and then we then we also then go into Revit and start massing it. So these are early sketches of the house in hand. The ground plane is reconfigured and organised, as I said before, around this central east northeast courtyard. Um, there's a large common um, volume as common as the heart to the house. There are these series of other. Um, family rooms that then pivot off that space, all with their own opportunity into different gardens. The second level um, is virtually, um, it's, a, it's a large family, so it's a second level that have their, each occupant has their own contained um, space uh, and large um, bedrooms. To that point though, there's a secondary common space for um, the occupants up through here that have the linkage back to this main area, but also then a link back up to the rooftop garden that exists over this pavilion. And this gives you an idea of how the elevations or how we'll start to work through that two-dimensionally, the existing ridge line, the existing house, and how it then morphs into these sculpted pop-up roofs, planters and edges to descale, also to diffuse su summer sun in, but allow winter sun in. Uh, again, in cross-section, bringing that indirect light, the access up to the pavilion, up into this rooftop garden facades that open up but yet protected. Just gives you an idea of that common space and the common volume to bring that eastern light in and then the western uh, indirect light brought into this space that all opens up into that central landscape space. And then the last slide is really just where the massing of the building's going. This brick, the brick that finds its way all the way culminates into this little pavilion through here. Um, terracotta, the terracotta roof shingles come down to hold um, and protect private stair spaces and also defend um, solar impact and then lightweight cladding um, that is almost um, 
of the original house's repertoire in that great 20s way of masonry houses. Any time there was an aperture or an opening, they would put lightweight cladding and shape it to the below or above that. We're taking that idea and using those, um, I, I, um, advancing that idea into part of our, our composition as a um, contemporary response to the original house. So that's it um, from me, but, um, but I'd like to thank you. I thank Brickworks, thank Cameron for the opportunity to share these projects with you. Um, I'd also like to thank um, some very key collaborators um, that we work with. Um, Twofold Studio, um, Zahn's definitely uh, have been amazing, and um, Troy Rafton of Visualize um, that help us um, turn a lot of these concepts that you can see into um, artwork that we can communicate to our clients too. So thank you. Jason's very cleverly left me minus 15 minutes to ask him questions, which may be a deliberate ploy on his behalf not to take any of my never difficult questions. So um, I will have to be very targeted in the two or three questions I can probably ask you, Thank you. <laughs> this evening. Um, one of the things, having visited the National Maritime Museum of China last year, um, that struck me straight away was the landscape as a metaphor in the building. And one of the things that occupied my mind in thinking about how to review the building was what made it feel Australian because there was a palpable mm. sense on the ground of it feeling like an Australian mm. building. Mm -hmm. And I, I really had to wrestle with that. And the, the landscape, and in particular the legacy projects, um, the family tree of, those, of that project really mm. compelled, mm. I think was compelling in terms of that story about the landscape. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be the question, or the answer we most go to when we say, what, is, what might define architecture in Australia? And I wonder if you could just talk briefly about um, your position in relation to the landscape and the way in which it might define mm -hmm. the practice of architecture in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I have thought long and hard about what it means to be in southeast Queensland and being an Australian architect. Um, I, 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 with, with the Maritime Museum, I don't see that as Australian architecture, but I guess yeah, it's the thinking behind it that I get what you say about how that relates back to landscape. But f for me, what is Australian ar ar architecture is a very difficult one. Um, I, I grew up in university under Russell Hall. Um, we were talking about this afternoon, Russell Hall, Rex Addison, um, Gabriel Poole, very, um, obviously, in, you know, nationally Glenn Merkert, all about very touching the ground lightly, um, respecting the landscape for what it stood for. I guess I was defiant to that and when I had the opportunity I wanted to defy that and hence with Aperture House it was really about hunkering into the landscape. So I think what is Australian architecture? It is landscape, whether it's natural beauty or whether it's cultivated. I think they're, you know, they're both the same, but it's how a building responds to that and its environment um, is what is key to our work and what I think is unique about Australian architecture, this love of landscape, this love of, of, of protecting to aspect and, 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 and elements, and I think that's key in all our work, and I think you see that resonate with a lot of Australian work, and I, on a global sense, you can see that clearly. Mm. So if you look at the last decade of your practice, both at Cox and in, in, in Blight Rainer, it's, it's striking the opportunity you've had in terms of working across scales and types of buildings, and that's quite remarkable in seeing um, the body of work that you've presented us with tonight. I wonder if you could reflect a little about why you think that's important for a practitioner to be able to, to move in that way and what the challenges of doing that are. Yeah, it's a good question and something that i um, thought very long and hard about. Um, setting up um, Blight Rainer four years ago was really about, oh, I just want to do houses, I want to do domestic scales, um, scale projects, and the phone didn't ring. 
it just didn't ring. Not that we were marketing, I guess, but um, but that was. Maybe you should have a website as well. Yeah, maybe we should have a website. <laughs> maybe we should have social media. Yeah. Um, but we 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 set out with that ambition to do domestic scale work, um, and thinking that would be a beautiful thing to do. Um, as you said, my history is in and around um, with Cox was really about public buildings, large scale public buildings, Australia wide and internationally. Um, but I always think change of scale is a very important aspect for architects to get their head around. So when we set out Blight Rainer, as I said, was that challenge of doing smaller projects, domestic scale projects. But I've always said to the staff and to our, 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 our view is to always, in the ideal world, I'd love to have a big project in the office and a small project. Um, so everybody within the practice can see how they, they both work and what goes into a large scale project in that procurement method, mainly. and don't get me started on that. But then also in domestic um, and just worrying about that level of detail, because that level of detail should also be in those public buildings. So the thinking is there. And I think what is interesting is, can you bring some of those learnings of those public spaces, those civic spaces, into those areas? And that's what I'm I'm enjoying is bringing some of that publicness into how some of those domestic projects are developing. That's great. Well, I think we're probably out of time. Did we make them long enough? <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Jason. It's yeah, been fantastic you. to catch up on yeah. um, on your work of recent times and to reflect on some of the themes that have been enduring across yeah. um, your practice. And can I might say, so you've seen the museum and I haven't, so good on you. <laughs> so I think I, I, there, are some built, there is one building that I have seen that Jason hasn't. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, and I've also had a, a preview of St Margaret, so it's oh, yeah, good to yeah, be yeah. able to piece that together as, yeah. a, as a suite of works. Yeah. So on behalf of Brickworks, I'd like to thank you um, for sharing so generously with us tonight and to the audience for uh, participating. Um, thank you everyone online who's been watching and uh, we'd invite you to keep your eyes out for future Brickworks events um, that will be advertised via their website. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to Eve and the team for hosting us here in the studio this evening. Good night.